Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, you can give like maybe one more minute to have folks come in. Uh, thank you again for participating today and we'll, we'll get started soon. Oh, all right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tano Lepule. I'm the Senior Program Manager at APIO, uh, the liaison to our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. I want to welcome you today and, and thank you for chiming in. I'm going to just kind of do some overview and some uh, agenda and housekeeping uh, to start us off here. Um, again, welcome to the Bridging Communities with Systems Change, Advancing Health and Equity Promising Practices. It's a two-part series uh, webinar series uh, with the session one being uh, promising practices and and lessons learned from our affinity groups uh, with the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. Uh, we're going to share that today and share that in today's webinar. Uh, next slide, please, Deshaun. A little bit about Appeal. Uh, we're a national nonprofit working to advance health equity and social justice to eliminate commercial tobacco, commercial tobacco and cancer health related disparities in our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities since 1994. Uh, we are one of eight national networks funded by Centers of Disease, Centers for Disease, Cancer, I'm sorry, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just uh, some of the faces of our communities that we work with and partner with. Next slide. Uh, today's agenda, I'll start off with some housekeeping. A little introduction uh, of the webinar with our special guest today, and then we'll jump right into our presentations from our panelists, um, from Richard Calvin Chang, Jake Fita Samanu, Joanne Ongo, and Malcolm Alo. And then we're going to jump into a group discussion, a facilitated dialogue discussion uh, with some Q&A, and then we'll close at the end. Next slide. Some housekeeping. It's a, this is a webinar format, so please, any questions, uh, click on the Q&A questions, uh, or into the chat box for that. Uh, your videos and speakers will be off, so if you could please participate in those uh, forms. We thank you very much for your cooperation in making this webinar uh, special for us, uh, speakers and our communities. Next slide. Here's an overview of our guest speakers today. Um, really appreciate the participation, and we're actually gonna share uh, with the rest of the group kind of their perspectives uh, and lessons learned and then also the document that uh, we had worked on. Uh, so we'll be, we're really excited to share that. But now I wanna go into the opening remarks and our special guests. And if we can have uh, Rob, I'll bring you on, Rob. Next slide, please. Thank you, Tana. And welcome everybody to this very important webinar. Um, really appreciate that um, people have taken the opportunity to join to really listen and learn and, and discuss critical issues for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, uh, particularly around commercial tobacco control and um, cancer control. Um, can we have the, there we go. So um, as Tana mentioned, I'm the executive director of Appeal and we are one of the eight national networks funded by CDC Office on Smoking and Health and Division of Cancer. And we really wanted to um, convene these uh, two webinar series to really uplift the critical issues that communities are faced and how uh, health systems, particularly health departments and health agencies can better work with the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, as well as tomorrow will be focused on the Asian American community. Um, ever since 
1997, when the Office on Management and Budget uh, declared that they would want to revise the standards to separate Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders as a separate racial group, there has been movement to really find ways to make that happen. And if you kind of reflect, that's 25 years ago that um, people are still trying to work on this. So we thought this would be a really important opportunity to build off of that in terms of how to operationalize and how to make it a reality uh, in terms of better serving um, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders as a separate racial group. We see this as a beginning part of um, partnerships that we would like to form with various health agencies out there, as well as community organizations. We have um, a really esteemed panel of speakers that I really want to appreciate both their time and their expertise to join us today. Um, but we also have uh, wanted to recognize the work of the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Affinity Group, which was convened earlier this year to come up with a guidance document that um, actually lists the key elements that are important for being able to, um, to work better with the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. Uh, finally, I just wanted to thank our team um, at Appeal and the Aspire Network, including Michelle, Tana, and Kehau. Um, thank you also to the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Affinity Group members, and then also to uh, CDC, Office on Smoking and Health and Division of Cancer for their support. Um, so I hope that this will be um, the beginning of a um, nurture relationship, um, that this will be something that you can take um, with you and that we can be able to build off of. So at this time, I would like to um, introduce um, Chris Benjamin, who will be also providing a welcome. Um, Chris is somebody that I've known for a long, long time and I've come to learn has been a true supporter of our communities, um, has been a true champion in terms of, of equity. Um, Christopher Benjamin, Chris, is the Deputy Branch Chief of the Program Services Branch at the CDC Office on Smoking and Health. And so it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Chris. Thanks, Rod. I, uh, whenever I see Rod, I smile. Um, once upon a time, uh, Rod and I did not have gray hair, and uh, that's when we met. Uh, we were we were teenagers then, so uh, it's always great to see Rod. I do feel uh, I feel a brotherhood with him. So uh, thanks, Rod. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Office on Smoking and Health, it is my pleasure to participate in today's webinar hosted by Appeal. CDC OSH supports efforts to identify and document how best to work with distinct racial groups, including Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. As part of OSHA's Health Equity Plan, the eight national networks funded by OSH, including Appeal's Aspire Network are compiling guidance along with a compendium of ideas to provide ideas for culturally relevant ways to work with multiple communities that experience tobacco related disparities and inequities. We appreciate and value diversity and the unique characteristics that we all share. We understand that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are separate racial group from Asian Americans. This fact was pointed out in the revised OMB 15 document. Today's webinar will identify some of these unique characteristics. We thank you for attending today's webinar. We encourage you to continue to engage with Appeal to better understand and work with Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Thank you, Rod, for convening us today. We appreciate the opportunity to learn, grow, and further our commitment to health equity for everyone. Thank you, Tanu. Thank you very much, Rod and, and Christopher, uh, for that welcome. And we're gonna jump right into our presentation with our speakers, our panelists, uh, who will be sharing their perspectives uh, from the work that they do. And uh, we're actually gonna kick it off with Calvin 
uh, who will be sharing the actual document and we will be providing you with that, that draft document that we created. Uh, go ahead, Calvin. Uh, good afternoon. I'll be presenting on some specific recommendations drawn from the NHPI Affinity Group's guidance document. Next. Our Affinity Group met and developed a set of guidance principles for engaging with our communities to build community capacity and leadership in tobacco control and cancer. These principles consist of five pillars, building relationships, more equitable funding allocation, collecting and reporting equitable data, equitable health policies that uplift marginalized communities, and lastly, specific priorities to consider for commercial tobacco control and cancer. Next. With regards to relationships, uh, I won't be going through every recommendation for each pillar, but I did wish to highlight specific ones. Next. As we know, trust is vital and NHPI communities place a very high value on long-term stable relationships. The key to this recommendation is institutionalizing long-term relationships with buy-in from high-level staff. Growing these relationships can help ensure meaningful program uptake, particularly from NHPI community leaders. Next. With regard to funding equity, equitable funding allocation will ensure that NHPI communities benefit from programs meant to address their health challenges and help sustain their work. Next. The recommendation being highlighted emphasizes the importance of funding organizations that have cultural expertise and a history of working closely with NHPI communities. Organizations that cover geographic areas where NHPIs happen to live don't necessarily have that expertise. By funding organizations with a direct connection and access to NHPI communities, that will help programs and health policy campaigns in hard to reach communities such as ours. Next. With regards to data equity, collecting and reporting data that accurately captures the NHPI community's diversity is a necessary foundation for understanding where our community is directing resources where they would be most effective and closing disparity gaps. Next. The NHPI label itself encompasses a diverse array of communities, each with a distinct language, culture, and set of traditions. Large disparities currently exist between NHPI communities across Islander groups and sociodemographic characteristics. Understanding associated health disparities will inform program development, evaluation, and health campaigns. Next. Policy and health equity can help ensure that our most vulnerable, marginalized communities are simply not left behind. Next. I wanted to highlight this recommendation because traditional interventions and research that prioritize large populations and sample sizes can and should be augmented with models that direct resources specifically to traditionally overlooked smaller populations, such as NHPIs. Next. Our final pillar lists specific priorities for commercial tobacco control and cancer. Next. While the importance of culturally tailored programs have been previously mentioned, the extension of tobacco cessation programs to include nicotine replacement therapy and support for relapse prevention is particularly important due to the high rates of smokers who relapse in our communities. Next. Thank you and for our next presenter, we have Jake Padizamane. Hi everyone. It's great to be here. I just have a couple of minutes and um, don't want to bore you with anything here because I don't have fancy uh, slides like Brother Calvin, but I do have some uh, points that we wanted to raise um, on the topic of working with Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, especially in terms of uh, collaborating with community-based organizations and building relationships with local health departments. Um, I'm wearing two hats and I, I love this conversation because um, I'm a formal public health official with the Utah Department of Health, 
uh, and come from uh, that side of uh, the road, as well as being an executive director for uh, Pacific Islander serving community based organization uh, here in Utah, um, which definitely gives me um, another perspective um, on this very topic from the other side of the road. Um, a few um, just points, um, and at this point, I, I do know that there may be some um, systemic or uh, agency institutional folks uh, in the room, um, but my comments are mainly directed towards uh, those who work with community-based organizations um, and just sharing some of the, I don't even want to call them best practices, but sharing some of the successful um, strategies and um, uh, ways of work that, that we've uh, been able to leverage here in Utah and uh, great to see Yvonne and other uh, Utah folks on the call here today as well. Um, one thing that um, as we learned through the pandemic uh, was that we needed real-time data, we needed disaggregated data, and we needed this data like now. We wanted to be very nimble and we needed to make evidence-informed decisions about how to address outbreaks in the community. We had a mobile, we have a mobile door-to-door uh, -door unit of uh, health providers um, that were able to provide vaccinations and testing and wraparound services door-to-door. Um, -door. And it wasn't helpful to have data uh, for incidence rates at a county level or even at a zip code level. We needed to get very granular. We wanted to look at street level and we weren't trying to um, intrude on anybody's, you know, confidentiality or, or um, reverse engineer the data to point out, oh, you know, this outbreak started at your church or in your home or your business. It wasn't that at all. Um, we needed to uh, have evidence-informed decision-making tools to be able to respond. And so one thing that we were able to do um, was we, uh, for lack of a better word, demanded um, that each of our local health departments appoint and designate um, an epidemiology liaison specifically for our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community. And what that meant was we had an email and a cell phone number and a direct contact to someone in the state epidemiology office, as well as each of the local counties where we have the largest Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. Um, and we were getting weekly reports, sometimes daily, if we needed it, we could request that. And we were getting reports that were very granular, uh, that were not available to the public, but because we uh, made the case for the need for this kind of data, we could look at census tract level data um, that was overlaid with, for example, um, COVID infection rates layered on top of vaccination uptake rates layered on top of testing rates. And so we were getting really good data. And because we had direct contact with epidemiologists who were assigned to answer to us when we called, they also helped us interpret that data. And that was very useful. And, and I think a lot of small um, grassroots community-based organizations may not have that capacity in-house. And so that's uh, something that we uh, use. And now um, that we're kind of pivoting away from the pandemic work a little bit, we still have these connections and relationships built. So now we can leverage that for diabetes data and for non-communicable diseases, as well as sexually transmitted infection and many other things so this has been a really great door uh, for us to open here um, and relationships built um, another one would be uh, leveraging and building long-term organizational relationships um, we're talking about you know high level uh, administrative buy-in uh, in ways that are non-transactional and so um, for example the questions we pose to our local health departments our local mental health authorities, um, you know, saying, hey, this is what your data says on your website uh, about our people, but, you know, this is what we feel like are also priorities. Um, or another common question is, you know, hey, we're absent from your data. We don't see ourselves in this data, or we are combined with Asian Americans in your data. Um, what can we do to help you remedy that? Let's fix that so that we can, uh, that's a mutually uh, that's a mutual benefit yeah for our community and your agency um, and we can help each other uh, to make sure that we're um, building those uh, relationships of trust and, and showing that we have human cap capital we have expertise in our community as well that we can lend to the agency if we can work together on these things um, 
again, I don't like to use the word demand, but sometimes um, we kind of wait for uh, invitation to sit at the table. And uh, one thing we've done here um, with pretty good success, we're still working on it, but uh, we have been demanding uh, compensated opportunities for Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders to uh, embed within the institutions and the organizations that we seek to change, that we seek to improve um, beyond just your like volunteer advisory committee roles, right? Which we all know and love and we all sit on these advisory uh, committees and they're useful um, for sure. But um, for example, we are working right now, um, have submitted an, a nomination that is moving up the chain um, that is supported by 10 other um, organizations with very high endorsements for a Micronesian uh, representative, somebody who can speak to uh, the COFA um, impacts and experiences of uh, COFA citizens, uh, citizens of the COFA uh, signatory nation on our Utah State uh, Medicaid Advisory Board, which has never been done before. Um, and so those kinds of um, representational opportunities, um, sometimes, you know, we can step up and uh, and suggest and endorse our own folks, uh, especially when the invitation is not going to come from uh, the mainstream uh, members of these kinds of boards and commissions. Um, I know my time is short, so um, definitely would emphasize pushing for uh, policies that uh, um, you know that really put funding uh, directly into the organizations that know the communities the best that have the best outreach capacity and the best networking um, who are trusted and who are already established in those communities. And here in Utah, uh, we have been able to do that with our local health departments and state health department um, in programs like It Takes a Village around maternal and, and child health uh, or the Pacific Islander diabetes self-management programs um, and, and many others. But um, health, very, um, willing and happy to share uh, some more of these ideas and hopefully uh, talk about them uh, later on this call and also happy to share um, if anyone wants to reach out directly. Um, but thank you for the time and uh, looking forward to the rest of our discussion today. Thank you, Jake. And I apologize, I didn't get to introduce our speakers. So Richard Calvin Chang is the Data Analytics Director of the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Policy Lab at UCLA's Health for uh, UCLA Center for Health and Policy Research. Uh, Jake, who just spoke, is the Community Health Program Manager uh, with Intermountain Healthcare, but he also shared his other affiliations, which a lot of our speakers today um, do have that community connection on top of their professional connection. Uh, so our next speaker is gonna be Joanne Ongo, who is the uh, Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands Cancer Register, uh, Pacific Regional Cancer Registry. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you, Tana. So, um, so just, just, just following with Jake, um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation that would go um, with, with my presentation. However, I'm here today to um, share with you um, the activities, um, what we do, what, we're, what we have been doing here in the CNMI um, to raise awareness, um, with tobacco, um, and then, you know, <clears throat> um, by using the data. So although I am the Commonwealth Healthcare, uh, Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands uh, Cancer Registrar, um, I was also the Comprehensive Cancer Control Program Coordinator uh, when the program, uh, in the program's first inception uh, back in 2007, <clears throat> within that year, um, you know, we had a focus on tobacco education. And so one of that focus um, was really to promote um, tobacco uh, awareness within, within our islands. Um, so one big effort that we took based on, on um, the data that we had collected is um, we had a cancer coalition that was very effective, uh, very, very active in the community. Um, it, it moved us towards the project of 
um, what do you call this, uh, working with our elected officials. And so through working with our elected officials, we were able to develop, write up a, what we call the um, Clean Indoor Air Act, which later became um, a law in the CNMI. Um, with the Clean Indoor Air Act, it was set in the, in the law that you cannot be in a, you know, th there's no smoking in enclosed areas. <clears throat> and if you must smoke, you have to be standing 25 feet away from an entrance. Um, you cannot be smoking where there are minors uh, present. And as much as possible, um, if there is an establishment, um, you know, like a bar, um, if you are serving any food at the bars, the, the law says you cannot smoke inside the bar. So anything that has to do with family oriented. So this, this law that was, um, the, the act that was actually developed and then turned into a law in 2009 had really gave a perspective of family unity, being able to bring your family out um, and, and enjoy a, a clean environment and not having to worry about secondhand smoking, you know, uh, and, and, and even thirdhand smoke. So going forward, um, that law again became more active when it became known that, you know, once you reach the age of 18, you can already purchase cigarettes because you're an adult. Well, um, it changed here in the CNMI. It became, you must be 21 years of age in order to buy cigarettes at any establishment, at any store. So using data that was gathered um, through the cancer registry, through the NCD, um, the youth risk behavior survey, the global youth tobacco survey that was being conducted within our islands, um, we were able to um, work with elected officials and we garnered all the support we could get. And surprisingly, we got support from, from establishments um, because they too um, <clears throat> knew the challenges that they're, they're facing. You know, just their, their, their staff comes in and they're not, you know, they're, they're breathing this, this air throughout the night that they're there, throughout the day that, you know, the, the whole shift that they're there they're actually doing all this. So <clears throat> having that law in place has really um, helped to open up the eyes of many community members. Uh, and that's thanks to all the community advocates that the coalition was able to, to um, hold on to, you know, to build that report and to build that relationship. You know, coming from a, a, a small island with a population of 57,000, give or take a little bit, you know, anything, anything that, that we can do to increase awareness or to um, project some positivity within the community, it is very much um, supported. We had great leaders um, within the public health unit, um, within the hospital who followed through and, and made sure that, that we, we as a coalition, we as a community, you know, took a stand and, and didn't, didn't fall. We, and if we, and if it happened that we failed, they were there to help us back up and, and to give us that motivation to move forward. So honestly, it's a lot of it is based on community efforts. Um, again, um, supporting with a lot of data. Um, the law didn't just end with just writing it up and then <clears throat> pushing it out to public health programs. The law actually also is now implemented in the environmental health um, approach. We have what's called the um, uh, former Bureau of Environmental Health Program, now known as the um, Environmental Health Disease Prevention Program. And so that program actually um, facilitates um, classes for establishment, e um, eating establishments, eating and drinking establishments. And they actually took that law and, it, and they incorporated it into um, 
into their their daily presentations. And so not only are they reminding um, the establishments that you're not allowed to do any, you know, um, to, to not only are they not allowed, but they must, um, they must uh, follow the, that regulation, that policy, and <clears throat> there is a citation. So when an inspector goes into the establishment and they smell smoke or they see evidence of smoking, they will cite that establishment um, because this is the law and there are, they are the regulators um, for that, that uh, promulgated law. So um, like I said, everything is a community effort um, without our community members and without the support that we got, you know, that we, we continue to get. Um, a lot of these projects are, you know, um, become, become more successful because of their uh, involvement and putting data out there all the time. Um, be it uh, just a tobacco approach, or here in the here in the Marianas, um, <clears throat> beetle nut is is such a high prevalence, and and so it's the behavior. So you know we do have the tobacco control program that tries to address everything. Be it through social media, be it through flyers, um, you know cessation classes. What what works is the community seeing motivated individuals wanting to do something for a change. So. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, and just uh, some background, uh, you shared some very uh, amazing work that you're doing out there and, and, and interested in getting into more details in the discussion piece. But I just wanted to give some background that the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands is out in, the, in Micronesia. And yep. just with that, the U.S. government has uh, unique relationships with our, our various islands, both in Polynesia, uh, Melanesia, and Micronesia. Yes. So thank you, Joanne. And uh, our last speaker will be Malcolm Allo from the Tobacco Control Program Coordinator uh, in Southern Nevada Health District. Welcome, Malcolm. You're on mute. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Tana. I appreciate it. Um, aloha, talofa, malolele, bula, yolano, have a day, and hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk really quickly here because I know we're running short on time, but I'm going to try to get my points across as soon as, uh, as, soon as I can. Um, my purpose or my portion of the, the talk today is going to talk about how we're putting some of these, these um, principles that um, was mentioned earlier today into practice. Um, here in Southern Nevada, which oversees Las Vegas, 76% of um, Las Vegas is in Nevada. Um, we do a lot of stuff with data, data, data disaggregation. And what, I, what I'm gonna talk about here is how we took the data and put it into some practice. So every two years in, in Las Vegas in the Southern Nevada Health District, we do a survey called the Southern Nevada Adult Tobacco Survey. And this survey is done um, for the past 28 years. And for many, many years, um, we, we take this survey to just measure the temperature on what is going on with tobacco control prevalence, policy acceptance, behaviors, et cetera. And for many years, um, like we mentioned earlier in this webinar, Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders were lumped together as in the same demographic question. Um, well, for many, many years, I've been pushing, and then I know we don't like to use the word demand, but in 2014, we demanded, or I demanded, that we separate these two, two different types of um, populations. So we now are asking in our adult tobacco survey, which is done um, every two years, Asian American information and Native Hawaiian Pacific Island information. And we finally got that data. And what the data showed us was not shocking because it was something we all already knew is that the smoking prevalence within the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities was extremely high. Um, what shocked us was that it was actually the highest rate amongst all other um, disparate communities here in Las Vegas. So that's higher than Latino, Latinx communities, African-American, indigenous communities, um, et cetera, and even Asian American communities. So we then identified that the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community as a result from our annual um, adult tobacco survey, which has been in, in motion for 20 something years, um, was the population that we needed to focus on. So what we did in um, 
uh, in 2019 is we authorized a partnership with the University of Nevada, Las Vegas to conduct a survey that's more in depth. So now we knew in general, native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders are smoking or using commercial tobacco products at the highest levels. Now we need to determine, well, what does this mean and who is this population? Um, as we all know, everyone on this call is that there are many different types of native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. You know, we got Tongans, Fijians, Samoans, et cetera. Um, and I need to know what type of populations are using these tobacco products at the highest level to then shape the program or the intervention on how to give them proper cessation um, or help them prevent them from using um, commercial tobacco products. In 2019, we started the survey. In 2020, COVID hit and it delayed the survey a little bit, but at, at the end of the day, it happened and we got a final report and I'm happy to share that with everyone. I think it's gonna be on the Peel website somewhere. Um, Tana can share that well with everyone, but we actually have a report now that did a qualitative and quantitative look at what or, and who within the Pacific Islander communities are using these tobacco products. Prevalence rates for Samoans, prevalence rates for Tongans, pre prevalence rates for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. Um, and that was invaluable for us because we needed that information um, to determine how we're gonna do our outreach and our strategies moving forward. As a result of that survey, I'm just gonna talk briefly about some successes we had um, within reaching these communities. <clears throat> The first thing first was we were able to turn the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, which is a minority majority university, completely smoke and tobacco free. Um, as people know, the UNLV, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas has a high population of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. They say it's the, the college system with the highest per population um, students that has the number of highest population of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. I don't know how to say that correctly, but the most Hawaiian Pacific Islanders per population at the university is at UNLV. So we were able to turn them smoke-free. So the concept of creating smoke-free environments where, where Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders can live, work, learn, work, live, work, learn and play um, was, the, was the foundation for everything we did here. In addition to that, we turned park systems, the Henderson's park system, the North Las Vegas park systems, um, completely smoke and tobacco-free. Another aspect we did to reach Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders as a result from that survey is we identified where do these people live in Las Vegas by zip code data. We took the zip codes with the highest populations of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. We worked with multi-unit housing communities in those specific zip codes and turned them smoke-free as well. And in addition to smoke-free, we also turned them cannabis-free. Um, for those of you who are not aware, in Las Vegas, we have, uh, we have a cannabis-friendly environment. So we also turned them smoke-free, vape-free, um, and cannabis-free. The thing that I'm most proud about is our community partnership. So um, we were able to partner with nine different um, Pacific Islander halals and hula groups um, here in Las Vegas. And we create a show called um, Malama. And Malama is working with all of these different halals and Pacific Islander groups, um, Tahitian groups, Samoan groups, et cetera. And we sponsor these groups. We work with the Kumu hulas to then teach their congregations or to teach their um, halals to not use tobacco products, whether that's through cessation or just promote healthier um, smoke-free environments. And you know, that opportunity is reaching thousands of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders here in, in, in Las Vegas, because once these um, kumuhulas or halals post our, our prevention messages on their social media pages or the individual halal members are posting it, it spreads. Um, we all like to eat. In addition to partnering with our halals, we also partner up with Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders small owned businesses. So we have nine also um, small owned businesses that we partner with. Um, in addition to creating policies through our Nevada Clean and Act, which already banned smoking in all of our businesses, we went ahead and said, if you wanna be a partner with us and you wanna help our community become healthier, you have to then create minimum distance policies. You cannot smoke near um, 30 feet from any um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander restaurant who's a partner of ours. Um, for that we can cr uh, create healthy environments as people are going into their favorite island restaurants. Um, and then lastly, what we did is we created a summer series called Inspire. And this Inspire series um, took the, the foundation of the Kamehameha Schools Exploration Program, where we bring together hundreds of teens and youth here in Las Vegas, who sometimes were transplants here. They moved here when they were too young um, or they were born and raised here. They just don't have that island culture or that island root. So we bring in speakers, um, that teach um, language, dance, food, ukulele, music, crafts, et cetera, about Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders history, um, in addition to teaching them a message about being healthy. And the idea with that is that if our cake year is healthy, if our kids are healthy, it will also influence our elders and our parents to be healthy. And that was something we learned through our many focus groups that we've done with the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community is that the elders who are using these tobacco products, the one thing that will move them is their, their cakeys are either asking them or them themselves are living in a healthy environment. 
All of these things that we've done here um, in Southern Nevada Health District and, and more is under the brand that we created called Island Envy. And Island Envy's model is strong, proud, and healthy. Strong of what I really believe in, proud of our culture and healthy in our lifestyles. And those three themes came out from the, the focus groups that we held with our communities is that our communities are strong, proud and healthy. So everything we do here, um, we have a specific eye, a laser eye focus on, on this community. Um, and there's many other things I'd like to share, but I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions and answers. But before I give up my time, I just wanted to give a shout out to um, my brother Ikeka Rigador from Papua Lakai in Hawaii. He is also on this call today. He and I worked together many, many, many years ago on some LGBTQI plus um, programming here when he lived in Las Vegas. So just wanted to say, welcome back to the Tobacco Road, Ikeka, glad to have you around. Um, but I think, Tana, I'll turn over my time, um, and, and that's it. <clears throat> thank you, Malcolm, and thank you to our, our panelists. Um, a lot of themes came out, the importance of data, the importance of liaisons, the importance of staff, uh, the importance of relationship with uh, local health departments or even federal health departments. Uh, but now we're going to transition to kind of a facilitated dialogue and please, I would encourage uh, our participants uh, to drop any questions you may have in the chat and we'll help to, our, our team will monitor that and hopefully be able to get to that. Uh, but I do wanna acknowledge and give it more uh, appreciation to our affinity group. Um, it was a group of 15 that spanned 15, or that spanned uh, five time zones. Uh, so you can imagine the coordination. Uh, we got together on a Zoom and then we had some follow-up emails that came about, and uh, that's uh, the the document that you folks have access to. It's a our draft, and um, it, it was made up of various sectors, from CBOs to local health departments to physicians and so on. So really appreciative of that. Uh, but I do want to get into uh, some of our questions here, and, and, and some of it is is geared towards uh, our our panelists here. Um, the first one is uh, you know going back to Calvin and your position as a with the data, with the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Data Policy Lab, is uh, data is obviously something that has uh, come to the surface here. Um, as far as Chris, uh, as far as uh, systems change, what is the priority? What is doable? And if you could share some good examples. So at the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Data Policy Lab. What we prioritize is trying to help community organizations achieve their goals by assisting them with their data needs. And there is no shortage of data needs when it comes to the NHPI community. Unfortunately, a lot of data sources will aggregate Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders with Asians or create a separate other category in which, um, unfortunately, our community simply remain hidden. So what we try to do is uncover what data currently does exist, try to make it understandable for other groups, but also try to collect data ourselves and try to <clears throat> put them in a much more user-friendly format so that lay people and organizations can use it to support their own work. Uh, for example, over the past two years, we had collected a survey of approximately 1,200 NHPIs in California to study their uh, behaviors and attitudes around tobacco products. And unfortunately, what we found was that there's a, an extremely high rate of tobacco users. And for a state like California, that is quite concerning, um, especially where trends are. And unfortunately, there have also been extremely high rates within the group that was sampled of um, smokers who had attempted to stop smoking and returned to it within a year. So that was also great, greatly concerning to us. So our hope is that we can continue to provide assistance to not just the organization, but also to health agencies so that we can share some of the best practices that we've learned about how to collect um, data from these hard to reach communities and report them in a way that will be meaningful for them. Thank you, Calvin. <clears throat> uh, this next question is uh, to Jake and Joanne, uh, especially given the work that you folks have done in communities. Um, and that question is, uh, what should communities do uh, to assist and how can they help encourage system change? For Jake or Joanne. 
I think one thing that communities can do is to not remain silent. I think we often have the first inclination to um, to address things internally or try to make uh, changes within. And especially when it comes to tobacco cessation, control, et cetera, um, we had some really great successes here in Utah with our island teams against tobacco. Um, which is a group that's in um, a lot of the different high schools that have um, Pacific Islander student groups. Uh, and it's been a really great way for them to get engaged, to go up to Capitol Hill and talk to their legislators and uh, to promote good practices and policies uh, on their own campuses, in their own homes, in their churches and communities, and take um, what could be a personal passion or a personal issue and make that broader um, throughout uh, and to bring others with you. So I guess that's something I would recommend or uh, promote is um, if we're sick and tired of being the first ones there or the only people who look like us there, then let's start bringing others with us and, and start making changes that way. Thank you. Yes. For us here, for us here in the Pacific Islands, <clears throat> um, in, in the CNMI, um, our community can, can be of, of, help to to the organization to the to the group by um just grasping the changes and accepting it um help us to promote for a better um community uh, because at the end of the day we're not doing this for ourselves we're not doing this because of you know um the, the funding says to we're doing this because we see the numbers we see the effect it does to not just not just one person, but the entire community as a whole. Um, picture, you know, we we kind of make it a point to show them, like, look, you 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 see, you see, um, cancer. Cancer affects not just the 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 cancer survivor or the the warrior. It affects the family. It affects the community, but most especially, it it affects the individual, you know, because they are having the, to, to, to consider what's their next step, you know, how long, you know, how long do they have left, um, things like that. So having the community to, to grasp the, the changes and to accept it. And, and something that I saw positive with, with the law is that, you know, um, the, the taxes went up for, for tobacco. Um, now you can get, um, a generic brand, uh, no less than five dollars, and then those name brands like Cool and Salem and Marlboro, you get them for no less than eight dollars a pack. Um, and yes, you still have those individuals who say, "Well, you know what? I'm I'm providing I'm providing it for myself." Um, but the the thing about it is that they don't they don't stand in front of you and nag you about it. They They've, they've accepted the fact that you're not supposed to smoke, you know, within vicinities where children are, are present, you know, and, and they, they respect it. So having that sense of respect within the community um, is very much appreciated. Coming from a very cultural, diverse community, culturally sensitive community, um, we respect each other with our choices, but we also try to remind them that you know, this is what you're not supposed to do, or this is what's best to do, and not tell them, don't do it because it's the law. We tell them, you know, think of think of it as a as an approach and a personal view. And don't look at it as 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 the community, don't look at it as a provider's view, but look at it as the personal view for yourself and your family. Thank you, Joanne. And um I do want to pose this to you, Malcolm, given that uh, you are with the health department. And um, I think this is something that's good for our participants to hear uh, specifically from he other health departments and how we could uh, kind of just help guide, and, you know, in addition to this guidance document that we're creating, um, also being available for some of those uh, support. Um, so the, the thought here is, or the question here is, um, what would you like to share with other health departments or agencies um, about our communities in order to improve conduct to wait, what would you want to a health department or other agencies, given your experience as a Pacific Islander within the agency, um, kind of guidance or or 
or examples of how we can incorporate uh, working with our communities. And uh, you're an example, but have you heard of maybe other departments or agencies that uh, are good examples? Um, uh, that's a big question, <laughs> but I, I think I think my answer would be is when we're working with health departments or when health departments are making um, system changes, we have to make sure we rely on the data, like Kelvin said. So um, how we got our 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 specific survey for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders from the original adult tobacco survey was looking at data. And once you present data to the, those that make the decisions at the top, it's hard to dispute. So I think using data to make informed decisions at high leadership levels um, helps. And then once you get the data that shows, like in our case in Las Vegas, um, that the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders have the highest smoking rates, um, after that, everything just kind of falls into place. But there are a few demands that I think I would like to um, ask people to make when they're working with uh, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders communities, especially in the beginning, um, that I think is, is outlined in our principles, but I just wanted to highlight one more time. I think the importance of long-term funding. When we started this Island NB brand to reach these NHPIs, um, I made sure that I worked with not only our local health department but where I work, um, but also with the CDC who's funding these activities to say, hey, listen, you're not gonna give us one shot funding to go into this community for one year with you know $50,000 and make the world change. You need to make sure you give us multi-year funding for a long period of time because behavioral change takes time. Um, so I think that was one demand that I had before we even started to invest in this community because communities like ours that are marginalized do not like to be, um, I guess, cherry picked for a couple of years and then popped out. So we need to make sure that we're there for a long time. The second thing I wanted to make sure and I encourage all health departments to do is make sure that you understand and you value your subject matter experts. So when I worked with our health department, I said, hey, some of the creative are culturally, linguistically, imagery appropriately and geographically materials that we're creating might not be something that you're comfortable with, but that is okay. You have to make sure you trust the subject matter experts in the communities. Also something that's laid out in the principal document um, that Calvin referenced in the beginning of our, of our webinar. Um, and then the last thing I think is hard for local health departments to understand, especially at the top levels, and even sometimes our funders at the federal levels, is that the amount invested does not necessarily match the impressions or reach compared to other communities because our populations are so small. So what that means in so much words is that if you are going to fund Native Hawaiian, Pacific, uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander outreach in communities, not necessarily on an island, so places that are states that are outside of the island, our population by default is smaller. Here in Las Vegas, we have 40,000 Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders according to the 2021 census. Um, but the cost um, to reach that community is going to be higher, but the reach is going to be lower. Um, but that is okay because we're reaching the community that needs it the most. And that's hard to understand because some people and some funders like to fund the highest reach possible. And that would just be, you know, the white Caucasian or in our case, the Latino community here in Las Vegas. Um, but we need, to, we need to trust the data and fund where data tells us to fund. So hopefully that made sense, Tana. Thank you, Malcolm. And I think those are some wonderful um, recommendations, uh, you know, piggybacking on the document that we've created um, and alluding to just, you know, communities who are often overseen or invi invisibilized. Um, I think uh, the message here is that, you know, we've created uh, this affinity group to come up with this guidance document and it's a guidance document. Right now it's in this draft form, um, but it's a guidance document on how local health departments, federal agencies, um, any of these entities can better work with our communities. And you've seen uh, and heard, you know, some of the passion behind it. Um, it comes through many years of, uh, previous efforts for being recognized as a community. This pandemic has really uplifted. Oh, see, now y'all getting me emotional. <sighs> this pandemic has really uplifted kind of the needs for some of these under uh, served communities. And I think uh, the document that we have created is a, a, a fair ask in, in just helping to guide folks to, to better work with our communities. Our speakers has eloquently uh, spoken to those points. Um, and this is not the last of it. The webinar is recorded and will be shared. Uh, but this affinity group and the affinity group members and their affiliations um, are here to, to be of service. Uh, but with that, I, I do want to bring, I see the time is close. I do want to give uh, any closing remarks to our speakers, our panelists here. Uh, and I'll just emphasize brief closing remarks. Um, I'll open it up to our speakers.
Can we do a ladies first? <clears throat> yes. Uh, um, okay, well, thank you, uh, everyone that's on the call today, most especially, um, thanks for that reminder, most especially uh, the Affinity Group for allowing me the time to share our successes here in the CNMI. Um, I mean, I look forward to continue working with all of you. Um, it is our Wednesday here. We're halfway through the week. Uh, it, so far, it's uh, it's been a nice week. I hope to see it stay like that for the remaining two days. Um, for those of you who are just on Tuesday, I wish you all um, a blessed week and um, continue work, working with, with all of you folks. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. I don't consider myself a, a content expert. Uh, so this was a great learning experience for me today. And, um, you know, my grandfather was a lifetime um, heavy smoker and um, to see him um, struggle with his own um, with his own uh, demons in terms of trying to quit and, and finally succeeding and being able to live the last years of his life um, tobacco free and being able to uh, articulate um, how blessed he felt. Um, and he really did feel that his life was prolonged because um, the support around him really helped him to be able to quit um, that terrible habit has been something um, that has inspired me in my life. And uh, I applaud all of you who are involved in leading uh, this work in your own communities and uh, hope to continue to uh, learn and, and become a, an even greater advocate um, and more uh, a positive contributor to this work that you all have been doing for a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, again, I would like to send my mahalo to Tana and Radha and Pio and everyone um, working on behind the scenes. I, I am honored to be a part of this group and, and happy to be here. Um, you know, I'd just like to close to say that, you know, if we focus again on data and some policy systems and environment to change strategies, um, I think that would result in the most success um, reaching our community. Um, when I speak to our Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, you know, I like to tell them here in the island that, you know, we fought hard and we continue to fight hard for our language. You know, we fight hard for our land. We fight hard for our culture. Um, it's about time that we stand up and we start fighting for our health. So behavioral change takes time, um, but I think all of our warriors here on this call can make it happen. So um, good luck and steadfast. Thank you, Calvin. Mahalo Nuloa for the Affinity Group, for all of the organizers of this presentation and all the participants that took the time to be here. Um, if, if I could only emphasize one point, it would be the very first recommendation about the importance of building long lasting relationships. And the best time to build relationships is before they're needed, before sacrifices are asked for. And it, it is a sacrifice for our communities to have to spend the time to work with outside agencies in order to implement all of these programs and campaigns. And it's really worth investing in making sure that there are connections between the communities and these agencies that are tasked with helping them before we reach a crisis point. And I just hope that there will be an incentive coming out of this meeting to know that those relationship building measures that we recommended that we've heard examples of from the other speakers, are effective and have worked. And I hope we see more of that in the future. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, Deshaun, if you don't mind putting on those last two slides, I just want to close quickly with uh, just some of the assistance that, and training that we provide here at Peel, uh, both at the community level and for our states. Um, definitely tapping into our affinity groups uh, as one of those resources to support um, technical assistance or, or just kind of any resource to entities from CBOs to local health departments and federal agencies. Next slide, please. I just want to end with uh, a big thank you uh, to our panelists, our affinity group participants on this webinar. Also to Chris and uh, CDC and the Office of Smoking and Health. Um, also, just thank you to our team here at Appeal for the logistics of this. Uh, but it, overall, just a, a, a big you know, appreciation again for communities to have space to be able to speak 
and help uplift uh, the needs, uh, but also the resources that we can contribute towards this. Uh, but with that, I want to say thank you very much. And in closing, I just want to give you back your day and thank you for investing in your time on today's webinar. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, all right, Tana. All right, um, Rod. Thank you so much. Okay, Malcolm. Thank you. We'll touch base. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.